Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so excited. I woke up fired up. There we go. I'm glad I can tell you. But I'm excited about this series, and I think you all know that already. That, um, I, I love this topic. I love this topic. And so, if you weren't here last week, we're delving into this idea of as, below, as above, so below. And looking at the spirituality behind astrology using something called astrotheology. If you're not familiar with it, you're going to learn more today. You can go to last week's message, as Ariel has already shared with us, and hear what we talked about last week. But last week, we uh, just a quick review. The topic was knowing is half the battle. And what we talked about was that we have moved from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, that we have moved from the age of I believe into the age of I know. And so as we talk about being in the age of I know, knowing is half the battle. Because we may know where we are and have some idea about astrology and spirituality or astrotheology, but just knowing about that is not enough. You must take that information and go out into the world and live your life differently and be a difference. But also knowing is half the battle because maybe this was new information for you. And so now you're stepping into a new awareness and that's half the battle because now you can stand in your life stronger and better than you were before. And again, we're in the age of I know, and so understanding that you're in the age of I know and letting go of beliefs, which is also rooted in doubt and it may not be true and it's rooted in somebody telling you what to believe, now standing in the, the idea of I know what is true. We also looked at the verse, an astrotheological text, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, meaning change your mind. Heaven actually being Uranus in Greek, or Uranus. Repent for the kingdom, change your mind for the kingdom of Uranus is at hand. And looking at the fact that Uranus rules the sign of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius, and we looked at the fact that Uranus is all about tearing down traditions and systems and all of those things that do not, do not serve us. And we looked at how that, that, we see that happening in the world. As we saw the recent Supreme Court decision, the destruction of Dolan, praise God. That's the perfect example of this age that we're living in. And so John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching this idea that although Jesus was ushering in the, the age of Pisces, also understanding that right after this is coming, the age of Aquarius. And so I want to delve a little deeper <coughs> into what this age is all about. And what I thought would be interesting was if we look at Aquarius is an air age. If we know a little bit about astrology, we know that each sign is ruled by an element. So we have earth, we have fire, we have water, we have air. So Aquarius is an air age. And the air ages are beautiful because it's, it's that, that enlightened, ascended age. Um, what's interesting when we think about air and we move up the elements, earth is of course tied to the ground, right? It's, it's physical matter. But then we rise up to fire, um, and, and that's a very different experience. From fire we go to water, and then from water we go to air, which is actually the spirit. It's that thing that we can't taste, touch, or smell, but here, and we interact with it all the time. And what I thought would be interesting was if we look at the last air age, which was the age of Gemini. Because what's interesting is that when we step into a new air age, or whichever age we're in, we can look to the preceding age and actually understand something more profound about where we are. And so I wanted to look at the last air age, which is the air age of Gemini. And in the age of Gemini, we, we find that that's the age that really brought us communication. We're talking about 8,000 years ago. And if you look back to that time, you'll see where languages were starting to be formed and uh, written languages were starting to be formed. Um, but what's even more interesting than that is um, there's, there's a text in scripture that is an air age text, and that's the book of Job. And so we're going to deal with the book of Job today, but before we delve deeper into that, I want to just, just touch on again this idea of the ages and the elements. Again, we talked about earth, fire, water, air. So where we've come from to get to this air age that we're in now, we've gone, gone from earth, which was Taurus. Um, the Taurus age, if we look in scripture, would be symbolic with that idea of having to 
sacrifice a, a calf or a cow to God. And we saw that not only in scripture, but we see that all throughout the earth. We can look at ancient cultures. There was an ancient idea that you had to sacrifice something to God to appease God, right? But what's interesting is the end of the Taurus age, if we look at the story of Moses, takes us into the age of fire, the age of Eris, right? The, the ram, the lamb. And so then there was a new idea that a lamb had to be sacrificed. And where we see that happening in scripture is Moses comes down from the mountain and he's frustrated with the people because they built this golden calf and he's coming down with the Ten Commandments and he destroys that golden calf. That was symbolic of destroying the age of Taurus and moving into the age of Aries. And then we move from Aries to Pisces, which is the age of Christianity. And so we have the final sacrifice. Jesus being crucified on the cross was symbolic of there's no more sacrifices needed. We're over that now. And now we're in this age of water. Christianity is all about water and baptism, right? If we look at, the, at all of the stories of Jesus, we see over and over again where he's talking about, come, let me make you fishers of men. There's always these water symbolism. The disciples were fishermen, right? So we moved into that age. And now we have moved from the age of water into the age of air. Another thing to think about when we look at those ages Taurus was the age of I have. Again, that's possession, physicality. Then we move to fire, which is I am. And again, in that time of Moses, who, who are you? I need to tell my people what your name is. And God replied back, I am that I am. And then we move to the age of water, Pisces, I believe. Well, if you believe on the Son and he was crucified, then you shall be saved. But now we're moved to the age of I know. I know what is true. And because I know the truth, I can now operate in my life. Another way to think about it, if we look at the stages of a child, of a baby, when you're first born, you're held, right? And then you learn to crawl. And then you learn to stand. And then you walk. And so this is where we're moving now. When we talk about being in the age of I know, being in the age of Aquarius, we're now in the age of just like a child moving through those stages to now being able to walk. Another thing that, that I think is important to, to, to talk about here is we talk about these stages. We find this all over. Um, and, and one of the things that was interesting to me, uh, I was thinking about um, alchemy, which is that idea of being able to turn a metal into gold, which is a metaphor in and of itself. It was never about changing that physical metal. It, you are the thing that is supposed to be changed. And so the, the, the metals each had a symbolism. And so you moved from lead to mercury to sulfur to gold. Okay, That represented moving from the body identification to soul to mind to spirit. Okay, Another way to look at that is to say we're moving from the subconscious to the conscious to interaction with the world to then interaction with the cosmos. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm using all of these because I want you to see the parallels. That as we talk about the age of Aquarius, the age of I know, as we talk about a baby now walking, we talk about the age of moving from mind to spirit, and then from the interaction with the world to interaction with the cosmos. That's what this age is about, and that's what we're being asked to really stand in. In the Gnostic texts, you find that they explain this in, a, in, in, in similar ways in all of the different texts. You'll find this idea of talking about when the twos become one. Not when two become one. We have the idea of marriage, right? That, you know, you bring the masculine and feminine together, two become one. That's one idea, but it says the twos. In other words, this, this four, I, I keep listing four things. Yes, yes? Right? We, we, we got earth, fire, water, air, I am, I have, I have, I am, I believe, I know, I have held, crawl, stand, walk, force. And so when the twos become one, then you will see the kingdom of heaven. It's said like this in the Gospel of Thomas, verse 22. Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make male and female into a single one, so that the male will no, not be male, nor the female be female. When you make eyes in place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, an image in place of an image, 
then you will enter the kingdom. And so what that's really talking about is uniting all of these pieces together to now become one. Because what's interesting when we think about the mystical understanding of astrology and we look at the zodiac and we look at the 12 signs, you are the zodiac. The zodiac is present within each and every one of us. Yes, we're born under a specific sign, but we actually operate, as I talked about, we move through our days last week. We move through the planets and honor the planets every day. But also, even just in the 24-hour period, we also move through the zodiac each day. And so the point when the sun is the highest, that corresponds to the summer signs of Cancer and Leo, right, in the afternoon and as we go into the nighttime. That then actually corresponds to the signs that are considered the winter signs. That's taking us into uh, Scorpio and Sagittarius and Capricorn. Um, many times we'll even find, um, I, I tell Yolanda sometimes as a Pisces, sometimes the reason why she's up so early in the morning really correlates directly to her sign. But we all go through that, that, that cycle every day. We go through the zodiac. So, we're in the air age, and again, what I thought would be interesting was to look at the preceding air age for some wisdom. And here we have the book of Job. Everybody's familiar with the book of Job, right? It's the, the general story of Job. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful text, and, and I want to just take a minute to just kind of talk about sort of some background with Job, because there's, there's a lot with Job, and um, people use that book for different things, right? Job is the story of a suffering saint. He was a man who did absolutely no wrong. According to the story, it was like he was perfect and God was proud of him. Like there's nobody on earth like Job. Um, but yet he experiences just unimaginable suffering. Unimaginable suffering. Everything he had was destroyed. Um, all of his children were, were killed. Um, he was a wealthy man. He, he owned you know, much cattle and all of that good stuff. He lost it all. And then even after that, then he, he became ill. Um, so ill, sores be, began to uh, manifest on his body, and um, flesh began to fall from his bones. And, and, and his own wife was like, why don't we just curse God and die? Like, she had no love for him, you know? And then after that, his, his friends come, and they're trying to convince him that you must have done something wrong. You displeased this God. Because that's the only reason this stuff happens, right? Because bad things only happen to bad people. And they were trying to convince him of this. And um, again, it's a familiar story, but it's also an old story. Job is where we kind of have crystallized this idea. If What we have in scripture um, is, it comes from the, the post-exile, or what would be called the post-exilic period. Um, if you study the history of the Hebrew people, they were taken into exile in Babylon. And during that time, they were feeling a lot of feelings. They were like, well, what's going on? Because we thought we were God's chosen people, and we have the Ten Commandments, and we're like the people. How could we be now in captivity, have no home that we call our own, and now we're, we're in this strange land? That's where, you, you, if you're familiar with the psalm, how can we sing um, when we're in a strange land? That's where that comes from. They were in that period where they're in exile, and there's, there's no longer a home. How can we sing when we're in a strange land? How can we be happy? when we're not in our home. And so the old story of Job came up. The, the, there was a, a group of writers, actually, that decided to bring this story back and really put it down on paper. It was a story that was known and told orally for many years. Again, it's 8,000 years old. But they were looking to this to try to find some solace, to try to find some understanding of what is the Spirit saying in this moment as I am suffering, we are suffering, although we feel we have done nothing wrong. That's part of the background of the book of Job, and it's really a literary masterpiece. I invite you all to, to read it this week. Um, you know, it's right up there with, with works of Homer, um, the Odyssey. It's, it's right up there with stories like Gilgamesh, these ancient, beautiful, well-written stories. Um, and if you look in the Bible, it's part of what's called the writings or the wisdom text. So you have Ecclesiastes, and you have the Psalms. And, and you have the Song of Solomon. These are the writings. And they're powerful texts. They really should be set aside on their own. You know, the Bible is put together like it's one book and it's not. Um, but with all of that, I wanted to give you that little background information because I feel it's important. But with all of that, there's actually even more 
that we can talk about when we look at the book of Job because again, it's from the age of Gemini and we're talking about astrotheology. It's actually an astrotheological text. And what's interesting to me is that all of these things are usually right in plain sight, but if we don't have the tools, we can't really see it. And when I talk about tools, what I'm really talking about, there's a, uh, a term that, that theologians use, it's called a hermeneutic. And what that is, is a way of seeing. So for instance, if um, I put on red colored glasses, well now I can see the world as red, and I can see things that way. If I put on blue, then I would see things that way. And so we take a hermeneutic to then look at the scripture from a specific angle. Um, there are different the theologies. There's liberation theology, which looks at the scripture from the standpoint that God is on the side of the oppressed, that God is always looking for the underdog to win, and God is always trying to support that person. Or we could look at scripture from a, a womanist or feminist perspective, right? And we can begin to critique the, the patriarchy that we see in scripture and say that God does not honor this. Um, if, you, if you ever want to really look at the book of Ruth, you know, people use that book all the time to say you got to find your Boaz. But as, 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 a, as a womanist theologian, I look at it and say, well, what kind of system is there that does not allow a woman who's a widow to be taken care of and needs a man to somehow legitimize her, right? We begin to look from that different lens and read and see the text differently. So today we're going to use our hermeneutic of astrotheology and look at the story of Job. And so right in the beginning of Job, we have Job 1, verses 1 through 5, and it says, There once was a man in the, land of, in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all people in the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. And that sounds like a regular old Bible verse. Yes, yes? <laughs> but there's some clues right there. And so as we put on our lens, our hermeneutic of astrotheology, I, I, I immediately see something about the sons and daughters that jumps out at me. It says there were born to him seven sons and three daughters, ten. It also says later on that um, his sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. It also says that later, because Job thought that his kids were sinful, he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. But from an astrotheological perspective, as I see that number seven, I say, oh wait, seven suns? Well, there are seven planets. In the ancient times, they were called the classical planets. That would be the sun, the moon, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, and Mars. And they're called the classical planets because those are the planets that we can see on a clear night, depending on the time of year, with our naked eye. Okay? But then, there are three daughters. Well, there's three more planets. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So, right when we have this clue here that we already know we're not talking about a real person. I hope everybody knew that. Already. Job never actually existed. Okay? But Job is, uh, is typified in an example of the sun and is typified as an example for us to then um, learn something about the nature of the universe and the nature of life. So again, he has seven sons and three daughters, seven planets, and three additional planets. But then also it talks about the sons used to hold feasts and go into one another's houses. Well, that's what the planets do, yes, yes, in the zodiac. As, as the world moves around, each planet lives in a different house. We know, uh, we talk about Mercury retrograde, which happens several times a year. And in that moment when Mercury, Mercury has traveled um, and is in retrograde, we know that that affects what's going on in our life. It affects communication. It affects um, uh, uh, sometimes making appointments. It also affects uh, technology. 
So we understand that, oh, that's what these seven suns are moving into the different houses, the different houses of the zodiac. Um, and they invite their sisters, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, to join in the party. But of course, the sun also moves through all of those houses. And so that's where we have that idea of, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings. Because the sun, of course, is fire, yes? Wouldn't the sun offer burnt off offerings? And there's also the ancient idea that then as the sun comes through, it cleanses the houses. And so right there, the writer of the story is letting us know, I'm not telling y'all about something real. Okay, right there, the, the author of the story is inviting us now to look from a deeper place and see what's going on. And so that's what we're going to do. And so again, as we talk about the story of Job, and he was afflicted, and he was feeling very bad, and the idea was that uh, uh, in, in the story, God and Satan, or the adversary, or the accuser, um, said that if if he was allowed to do something to Job, that Job would curse God. And, and God didn't believe that would happen, and Job didn't. Job never cursed God. But he was feeling a lot of feelings. And he was seeking, he said, okay, well, you know, God is out there. This is what he's thinking. God is out there. I can't touch God. I can't access God. But if I had a helper, or if I had an advocate, or if I had a redeemer, someone that could sort of almost act as an attorney on my behalf to speak to the great and powerful God and say, you know, I'm, I didn't do anything wrong. Maybe this will change. And so here in chapter 19, we have a very famous verse where Job says, for I know that my redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin, my flesh has been destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. That's that great verse, that, if, you, if you know Handel's Messiah. I know, I know that my Redeemer liveth. It's a beautiful, it comes after the Hallelujah Chorus. It's beautiful. But what is he talking about? He's seeking something outside of himself to save him, or to, to alleviate this pain and suffering. And so he, 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 wanted, he, he wanted something different, uh, he wanted a, a, an experience that would allow him to have something different in his life. And so when I began to read that and think about that, again, this idea of Job wanting some, someone or something to redeem him or to really advocate for him, as an attorney would advocate for someone, I began to think about us moving from this age of believe to I know, ascending up these levels, moving from being held to crawling, to standing and then walking. Well, we're, we're in this air age, we're in the age of the spirit, we're in the age of enlightenment, we're in the age of ascension. And so it's interesting that Job is talking about that, uh, in, and, and after my flesh has been destroyed, then in my flesh shall I see God. Which is a, this idea of where we've ascended as we move from earth to fire, to water, to air. We recognize that the flesh in this particular example represents our ego. It represents everything that we hold that is attached to what's really not real, the truth of who and what you are, because you are light, you are power, you are joy, you are courage. And so he's understanding that somehow, I don't know how, but my Redeemer lives. There's something within that will move me forward and allow me to, in my flesh, see God. And so this is where I got the idea of the title, See God and Live. Because, you know, it's interesting when we think about the ancient times, and, and we look again at moving through these elements, you know, the reason that in the age of Aries, we see in Scripture God is a consuming fire. There was this sense that you couldn't touch God, because this was the age of fire. You couldn't touch God. But we're in the age of I know, which means that now we understand exactly where God is. We understand exactly where God lives. We understand that there's no separation between us and the divine. So Job goes on. And again, as I talked about, his friends were of no help. <laughs> no help. They made him feel worse. And eventually the voice of God comes on the scene. And the voice of God begins to explain a few things that 
really God lives beyond this world. That there's some, there's a higher understanding and a higher purpose that's going on that we can't see from our vantage point. And Job recognizes that all this time, as I was saying, I know my Redeemer lives and I wish someone would come and advocate for me. He's now had a direct experience with God. Because this is something that didn't happen. He was like, I don't know how I can access God or touch God or have this conversation with God to have a change in my life. But God shows up on the scene. And, and we must understand that, again, Job is not a real person, but we must understand that this was actually happening within him. One of the things I love, uh, Dr. Will Coleman talked about uh, in the context of the Moses story. He said the reason that the burning bush wasn't consumed is because that whole experience took place in his mind. And so that's where we are right now. And so Job, after having that encounter with God, he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. And I want you to take that in for a minute. Because this is so much about moving into an air age. Moving from believing to know. See, in the believing age, it was I heard about this thing. I heard that there may be power within me. I heard that I might be the light of the world. I heard that there may be a God, a power, an infinite intelligence that lives, moves, and has its being in and as me. And we live, move, and have our being in it. I had heard that. But now I have an experience of it. Now I know it because I have seen you. And again, this takes us back to the idea of seeing God and living. Because before, if God was a fire, how could you see God and still live? You would be consumed by the fire. But now you can see God in this age and live. You have an experience of God. And that experience of God is what will move you forward in living. And so I began to think about this idea of being in the age of the Spirit. I hear the voice of Jesus. Jesus promised that a comforter would come after he goes away. At the end of the age, a comforter would come. And if you look in Scripture, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you'll see that Jesus gave them specific instructions about where the Passover would take place. This is the scene of, of uh, the Last Supper. But Jesus commands them very clearly to go to the house where you see the man carrying a pitcher of water. And what's interesting about that, again, we put our hermeneutic on and we have to now look at the history of what was happening in that period of time. Men didn't carry pitchers of water in that time. There was another story with Jesus with the woman at the well, right? That was considered a woman's job. So where on earth are the disciples going to find a man carrying a pitcher of water when men don't carry pitchers of water? Well, the image of the sign of Aquarius, it's called the water bearer. It's a man holding a pitcher of water. And so Jesus was cluing them in, or this story was cluing us in, on where... We must be in order for the comforter to come. And so I'm going to go to the book of John, and I'll just give you a, a, a little background here. When we have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they represent a number of things. One, they represent the season, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And the book of John, that winter book, really takes us to the month of January, or January, or January. And January, of course, is the month where Aquarius comes on the scene. And so I thought it was interesting, the words that we hear in the mouth of Jesus here. In John 14, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Another translation of that word is comforter or helper. To be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. He goes on and he says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So here we are in this age of the Spirit. And Jesus was saying very clearly that when I leave, when Pisces leaves, something else will come on the scene. 
It's the very thing that, that Job was asking for. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that there is something here. There is something present within that will allow me to rise up and see God and live, to experience God and live. And Jesus is saying, you know this thing. It abides not only with you, but it abides in you. That spirit, that advocate, that comforter, that helper, that redeemer, it lives within you. And he goes on and he says, I love this. He says, and it will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. It will teach you everything. See, what I know to be true, and I talk about it all the time, we come to church simply to remember. We really can't be taught anything. But there's a comforter, there's an advocate within you that is going to awaken the truth that has always been present within you. There is an advocate, a comforter, a helper within you that is going to awaken. Uranus is called the great awakener. It's going to awaken these truths that have always been true within you, that you are the light of the world. That you are power itself, that now it is time for you to stand in this world no longer believing, no longer listening for someone to tell you what to do, to be or to say or how to operate in the world, but knowing that you came into this world with purpose and design and it is time now to live that out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this takes us then to the day of Pentecost. This in scripture was the moment that the spirit fell on the disciples. Now, what's interesting to me is that they went to the upper room. We're talking about this ascension, yes, yes? We're talking about this ascension of moving from earth to fire to water to air. And you think about when water is heated and it dissipates into the earth, into the air. You can no longer see the molecules, but they're here. But they're up. They've moved up. They rise. The steam, it rises. And so we have that wonderful example of what happens when the Spirit fell on the disciples. What's interesting to me is it spoke to a level of equality that we see are the qualities of the Aquarius Leo age. In that moment, they were able to speak in unknown tongues, but they really weren't unknown because there were people there that understood the language. And so now that represents to me a unity that happens there. There was a collective unity where everybody was one and nobody was left out because they understood what was being said. You know, and, and this is an aside, but I got to say this because, you know, uh, people talk about speaking in tongues all the time. And, and, I, and if you look at what happened there, again, the words that were spoken were understood by the people. It would be as if I began to speak as I'm speaking now and David began to speak in Chinese, and there's someone who speaks Mandarin or Cantonese and understands. But then as I'm speaking, someone else begins to speak in French, and there's someone from France who knows and understands the language, and it's like, oh my God, no one taught them these languages, but I understand what they're saying. That's what happened, okay? So this whole idea about unknown tongues or speaking some other language is just not in the text. Now, we can talk about what, what speaking in tongues may be. There's a, there, if you look at ancient traditions, if we go to the Yoruba tradition, if we look at the Native American traditions, there, there is a, a power and there are things that are happening in some would call spirit possession, which is very real and true, but that's not this. That's all I'm saying. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful tradition, and, and, and I believe that in America, really what has happened, the speaking in tongues that we see in this country is the infusion of African spirituality in this country. That's really all that is. But it has nothing to do with what happened on the day of Pentecost. I must say that. I must say that. So again, they went up to the upper room. And this is what we're seeking to do as we're moving into the age of Aquarius, as we're in this age of air. And so what I believe in this moment is that it's time for us to make up our minds. I, I love that phrase, the idea that we make up our minds. That we must actually lift up our mind, lift up our thoughts to really stand in this age of I know. And what came back to me on Easter Sunday, I shared this idea that if you look at the story, the crucifixion story, each book says one thing the same in each book. They don't always agree. But it says that the crucifixion took place at Golgotha the place of the skull, which means the place of the skull. It, it actually clued us in. It wants you to know 
that this place means place of the skull. And what I shared then, I want to share with you now to remember that the crucifixion takes place at the place of the skull. It takes place in your mind. And the symbolism of the crucifixion, what happened, that was the moment that Jesus fully died to his physicality, to his humanness, and the Christ consciousness came forward. And so I'm offering to you that it is time for us to make up our minds, to now go to the place of the skull and allow the ego, allow the false self, allow the fears, allow the doubts, Allow the worries, allow the smallness to be crucified that the Christ in you, the hope of glory, may rise. It's time for us to make up our minds, and I know that as we do that, well, then we will see God and live. Oh, my God, we will be God and live. And we can say with Job, I had heard before with my ear, but now I see we could say with Job, yes, people talked about this spiritual thing, but now I know. This is where we are being invited to stand, to make up our minds. I invite everyone to stand with me now. As we offer a prayer, as we're standing in this idea of seeing God and living, of being God and living, Allowing all that is small to die. Because they are weights not allowing us to rise. They are weights hiding the Christ in you that is seeking to emerge. And so God, we are grateful and thankful to understand on a cosmic level and on a physical level where we are standing now in time. We are grateful and thankful to understand that all of these wisdom texts and scriptures and ideas that the ancients knew and heard and wrote down and believed, we can now take these things and see with our own eyes the deeper truths, the deeper meanings that were always right there in front of our face that we were hearing, but now we can see. And as we see, we are seeing ourselves. As we see, we are seeing you. We recognize in this moment that there is no separation between the all that is and us. I'm hearing the words of A Course in Miracles today. God is my life. I have no life apart from God, for I live, move, and have my being in the all that is. And as I recognize that, I recognize that there is no room for fear. As I recognize that, I recognize that there is no room in the mind of God for doubt. As I recognize that, I recognize that there is no room in the mind of God for smallness. As I recognize that, I recognize that there is no room in the mind of God for anything other than light, for anything other than love, for anything other than demonstrating the power, the peace, the ease, the bliss that we are. And so we release the chains on our purpose now. We release the chains on our design and destiny now. We release the chains on all that we are. And we allow the earth, we allow our brothers and sisters to experience the beauty that we are. On this day, in this moment, I speak a word over everyone here in this room and within the sound of my voice. As we are all choosing to make up our minds, as we are all choosing to go to the place of the skull and make a new choice, as we are all choosing to go within our minds and live life differently from the place of mind, from choice, no longer are we choosing to be victims. No longer are we choosing to be powerless. No longer are we choosing to let life circumstances beat us down. Yes. We allow the feelings yes. to come forward, but like my brother, Reverend Ike, we say, we tell our feelings how to feel. Yes. Mm. And so I speak a word of encouragement over each and every person in this room. I 
wrap them in love, I wrap them in peace, I wrap them in ease as they move through this week, making new choices, as they move through this week, standing in power, as they move through this week, now recognizing that there is an advocate, that there is a helper, that there is a comforter that has fallen on them and has always lived within them. And as we choose to be the light of the world, as we stand in our design as the light of the world, I am grateful and thankful for the ways in which this earth will light up. I am grateful and thankful for the ways in which this earth will light up as the sun lights up this day, so we shall light up the days of our lives. And together, we lift up our voices and we say, Amen. 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 Ashe. Ashe. Ashe.